I want to welcome everybody. If you're visiting the Grand Abbey Hilltop Church, we're very thankful that you've chosen to worship with us today. And we always remember there are a lot of people that are watching and listening out there uh, from all different backgrounds that are studying the Word with us. We also have our online members. Uh, there are, we have about 300 people scattered around the world, and they are members of our church. They have no local church they can attend, and there are online members, and we actually have Pastor John Q, who still spends time ministering to those people. And if you're in a category where you're just tuning in on television, you want to know, how do I become an online member? Then we invite you to go to the Granite Bay uh, SD uh, website, and you can find out more about that. Our message this morning is dealing with the subject of Satan and the Savior in the synagogue. And it's almost all based upon Luke chapter 4. So you may want to take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 4 right now. And um, I'll tell you a little story. When I was a young pastor and just finished working in New Mexico, I got a call to pastor a district with three, for a little while, four churches in Texas. And one of the churches, I've never seen anything quite like it before. It was a little town. I won't tell you where it is. You'll understand why. A little town. A woman had died a few years earlier who was very wealthy with oil money. And in her will, she stipulated, I want to build a church in this town fully furnished, maybe held 60 people, fellowship room, Sabbath school rooms. And it was a, uh, they said, this is one of your churches, Pastor Doug. And brand new church, new piano in every room, a new building, new carpet, nice paved parking lot. I mean, uh, no expense was spared. It was just small, but very nice. Church dropped from heaven in a little town. Well, the first Sabbath I go there, I'm in my 20s. And I arrived early, and the head elder said he would meet me there. And I got to the church, and the head elder was there, and the head deaconess was there. And they were opening up the side doors. They were going to show me the church. I don't even remember what happened. They were the only ones there. Now, this is a church that had maybe 20 members, and that's with a tailwind. It wasn't a big church. But something was said between the head elder and the head deaconess. It was just the three of us there. And they got into a wrestling match physical wrestling match and if I wasn't so shocked it would have been entertaining <laughs> but because they're you know they're in their 60s and I thought I'm I'm the new Christian I'm your pastor first day I'm meeting you beautiful new church and they had an argument and <laughs> they were trying to throw each other out of the church <laughs> I'm serious and, and I think she was winning because <laughs> She was taller. And they're wrestling and they're pushing and trying to push one. It was a sliding class there. They're trying to push each And I stood there. I'm just speechless. I'm thinking I should probably intervene. I'm the pastor. But I was so shocked. I thought, you know, I'm the kid. This is a head elder and the head deaconess. And, and they're both trying to throw each other. One would like sumo wrestles, trying to throw each other out of a ring, except they weren't that big. You know, they're all trying to, no, you out. No, you're going out. And and I thought one of them was going to go down, and I was worried about it. Finally, I came to my senses. I stepped in and said, hey, we're Christians. We're not supposed to do this. <laughs> I never forgot that. Praise the Lord, I wasn't there very long before I was transferred to California. But uh, that was rather disturbing for a young pastor because I had no idea that such a thing could happen. Well, you know, there's a story in the Bible that uh, sort of illustrates some of that. So turn with me, please, in your Bibles to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 4. We're going to be starting with probably verse 16, and we're dealing with the first sermon that Jesus preaches in his home church, okay? Give you a little background. You know, Christ was baptized down in Judea there in the Jordan River, um, what they call the you know, southern part of the kingdom. And he did some ministry there following the temptation and his baptism. 
Uh, eventually, John was arrested, and he thought it would be advisable to go north. He went up north in the area of Galilee. And Galilee was a place where you had uh, Jews and Gentiles. Some Jews were actually intermarried with the Gentiles. Even in the time of Isaiah, it calls it Galilee of the Gentiles. So it was technically Jewish land, but there was a lot of Gentile influence there. And that's where Christ spent most of his time in ministry. But then his mother invited him to a wedding up in Cana, five miles away from Cana after the wedding, which sometimes lasted several days. He thought, well, I've started my ministry. He had been doing some teaching and preaching and miracles. Word had reached and spread. Probably ought to visit the home church. So he goes to his home church, and here's where it picks it up. In verse 16, Luke chapter 4, verse 16. Some of these verses will be on your screen. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, to the verses that Pastor Ross just met a, read a minute ago, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and he gave it back to the attendant. And he sat down and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed or fastened upon him. This is long Paul Harvey pause, if you know what I'm talking about. And then he shocks everybody by saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now, just a, a few words of explanation, introduction. You, you don't find the word synagogue in the Old Testament. Uh, they did have places where they worshipped. It tells about the work of the Levites was to go and to teach the word. Sometimes they made it, maybe did it in families. They may have had places or tents that were uh, provided for that. You really start finding the word synagogue after the Babylonian captivity, and the temple had been destroyed. And so every Sabbath they would gather for the reading of the word. In fact, it was tradition that um, usually first a priest or a Levite would read something from the word, and then the local rabbi would read something, and then they would have up to seven different readings. And after you read the scripture, then you would sit and expound or teach. That's why you notice in our church we stand when we read the word. It was considered the word from God. You stand out of respect. You find in the book of Ezra, when he opened the book, the people stood up. We have great respect for the word of God. And so Jesus comes home and he comes to Nazareth. Nazareth at that time is a town of, they're not sure, but somewhere around, you know, 1,500, 2,000 people. It wasn't really big. It was small enough where, you know, you do your shopping and you knew who had the carpenter shop and they, they recognized each other. And so it was a small town. It didn't have a great reputation. You remember when um, Philip told Nathaniel, he said, we found the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, Nathaniel said, Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? So it didn't have a great reputation. Nazareth was on the wrong side of the tracks, if you know what I mean. But that's where Jesus grew up. And it, it tells us he, of course, had a, a custom of going to church on that day. So we're going to break this down a little bit, and then we're going to go, go beyond. First, I want you to know, it says, Jesus went to church on the Sabbath. Can you say amen? amen? And it doesn't say he did this once or twice. It said this was his practice. When people ask me, Brother Doug, why do you go to church on the Sabbath day? I said, well, because Jesus did. It's one of the Ten Commandments. It was a practice of the Lord. And I don't find anywhere where the Lord says that he has now done away with it or changed it. Not going to find that anywhere in the Bible. By the way, friends, um, you might be interested and encouraged to know, last week I was at what they call the National Religious Broadcasters Convention. Karen and I were there together with some of our team in Nashville, Christian broadcasters from all over North America. 
uh, some Adventists, non-Adventists, a lot of lovely people gather. The main reason they're there to defend the freedom we have in our country to broadcast on public airwaves. You know, in some countries, like even Britain, you can't do that. And I could name a lot of other countries. So I've been part of that group for, oh, 35 years I've been going. And uh, meet a lot of people from all different Christian faiths, some wonderful people. I can't tell you, and you can ask for the testimonies from Karen and others that were there, how many people came up to our booth? They said, we love your programs. Well, these are not members of our church. We are so blessed by your programs. One Baptist pastor came up. I got a picture of him. I won't show you because I don't want to embarrass him. But I, a Baptist pastor and his wife came up, dignified. Look, he said, Brother Doug, he said, I know you're trying to make me an Adventist, and you're not going to do it. But that made me happy because that means he's thinking about it, or he wanted to say that to me. But he said, we sure do appreciate your programs. Then a Pentecostal pastor came up to me. And he said, you've saved our lives. He said, no, I'm not going to become an Adventist. <laughs> I'll tell you what he told me. He said, um, I took a picture with you five years ago because we've been watching your programs for years. And I've been trying to get my mother had a stroke. I was trying to get her in a nursing home, and they're all full in our town. There was no room. And after going from one to another, and she really needed to get into this, this nursing home with special care, I was talking to the, the nurse attendant at the desk. She says, I'm sorry, we have no room. And he said, oh, but I've been praying about it. She said, you're a Christian. He said, yeah, I'm a Christian. And he said, then I showed her my picture with you. <laughs> and she said, no, don't misunderstand. I'm just quoting what he said, she said. She said, oh, you watch him. He's my prophet too. <laughs> now, don't be, shook, don't be shook up by that because I used to go to charismatic church. They call the pastors that, so that don't, don't. But they're watching. And he said, she said, I will get your mother into the home somehow. And he said, so we just need to praise the Lord. Brother Doug, you've changed our life. <laughs> but we're not joining your church. And then I got in the elevator. And um, I can't tell you all the stories. I got in the elevator, just me. And this girl steps in, for a Middle Eastern young lady, young adult, professional. And she turns around, she looks at me, and she shrieks. <gasps> And she said, oh, can I get a picture? They'll never believe it. She says, you don't know how many hearts you're changing in Iran. She says, I, she works with, she says, the Christians in Iran, they're watching you on the internet and satellite. You may not know, we translate our programs into Farsi and many other languages. And so took that picture with her and she got out of the elevator and I was so touched by that. So it was a wonderful experience. So the reason I'm telling you that is that um, the Word of God transforms. And there are good people out there, and, and they are looking for the truth. They're hearing the Sabbath truth. Don't ever be ashamed that you believe in keeping the Sabbath because you follow Jesus. Jesus did. And a Christian is a follower of Christ. As his custom was, he went. And you notice he went. Even though the people may not be friendly, you'll find out. Some people say, oh, I'm not going there. They're not friendly. Jesus went anyway. And it may not be a beautiful building. And uh, the sermon could be boring at times. But God will bless you. You are always better off gathering together, obeying the command, and assembling on his holy day. That's part of the command. It is a holy convocation, a coming together, than staying by yourself. And I worry, you know, you can break the Sabbath just as much by staying at home and not working when you're, you're healthy. I'm not talking about people sick and they can't go. I'm talking about people that can and they don't. You might get out there and drive railroad spikes and you're breaking the Sabbath. Part of it is to come together. Amen? Amen. He says he will meet with us when we gather in his name. And as we enter the last days tells us in Hebrews, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. Amen? So especially after COVID, and I know that was an exception, but I'm just saying, hey, we're past that now. Some people still haven't gotten the victory over that, and they're still doing it all from home. We need to come together. Jesus went to the church. He didn't think about it. He didn't watch it online. He went to the church on the Sabbath day. 
You can read in Mark 1 21, they entered into Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath day he entered the synagogue. John 18 20, Jesus said, I spoke openly to the world, always taught in the synagogues, in the temple. In Jerusalem, he'd go to the temple. In the towns and villages, he went to the synagogue. Just like Daniel had a practice of praying and reading the word three times a day, Jesus every week was in church. So he's promised to meet with us. Amen? The other thing I really appreciated, it may seem simple, but it says he read the Bible. Jesus came to church and he read the Bible. And what's really neat, it says they handed him the book of the prophet Isaiah and when he opened the book, he found the place. Now you realize in Bible times, when he opened the book, it's not a book like our Bibles. It's a scroll. They call it a book. Graphia. And he would roll it. I think that when he went, he was a guest speaker. They said, what scroll would you like? He said, please hand me Isaiah. The attendant gave him the book of Isaiah. And he opened it and he found. Isaiah's got 66 chapters. There were no chapters and no verses in Jesus' book. But he found the place. How are you at finding the place? Do you know your Bibles? I remember kids would come home from Sabbath school and they'd sing a little song, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You know what I'm talking about? They'd memorized all the books of the Bible to Revelation. Can you do that? If I were to ask you right now to find the second chapter in Hezekiah, how many could do it? I saw some hands go up. There is no Hezekiah in the Bible. I saw your hands, I saw your hands go up, and then you thought, oh. <laughs> but we should know how to find the place, right? We should know our Bibles and be familiar with them. I've actually been a little handicapped lately because I do so much study on my computer, it's different from when I hold the Bible. And you can kind of become dependent, but there's blessings in that too. Boy, I can search things really quick right now. But he knew his Bible. Acts 13, 15. And after reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them, saying, You men and brethren, have you any word of exhortation for the people? Say on. So Paul, as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and they, as a visiting rabbi, he was actually a Pharisee, they would say, after they did their typical reading, we've get, got a guest here, is there anything you'd like to say? Karen and I went to church in Jerusalem. You know, our church in Jerusalem is not really very big. And Karen said, they looked out and they saw me there and they said, Doug, they're going to ask you to preach. And I had no warning at all. She was right. After they had their preliminaries, they said, we've got a guest. Would you preach? And it was an honor to be asked to preach in Jerusalem, I'll just tell you. Small group, but that was the custom back then. So they asked Jesus to preach. No chapters and verses. He found the place. Jesus read his Bible. Further proof. When he was tempted in the wilderness, which is the first part of Luke chapter 4, he said, it is written, it is written, it is written. Look in Matthew 12, verse 3. He said to them, have you not read what David did? Matthew 22, 31. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read... He was telling the religious leaders, you don't know your Bibles because you're not reading. John 6, 45, Jesus said, it is written in the prophets, they will all be taught of God. He knew his Bible. He did not know his Bible because he was the son of God. He knew his Bible because he read it the same way you and I know our Bibles. Amen? And that's what we're going to need to fight temptation. So he goes to his home church. And what does he do? He asks for the prophecy. Someone did a study. I think I've got it here. Yeah. Liberty University Theological Studies, Harold Wilmington. It's been estimated over one-tenth of Jesus' recorded New Testament words are taken from the Old Testament. One-tenth, a tithe of everything you read, Jesus saying he is quoting from the Old Testament. That is a good practice for preachers to make sure their sermon is riddled with scripture. Amen? That's what Jesus did. How many of you have seen it before? A pastor will open the Bible. He maybe open the Bible. He might not even open the Bible. And he'll read a little verse and then he'll pontificate for 45 minutes. Or talk about the latest comic he saw in the paper or whatever it might be. 
Bible-based. It's how Jesus taught. It should be rooted and saturated in every warp and woof of the fabric with the Word of God. He was a Bible reader, and he was a Bible writer who wrote the Bible. It all came from him. He is the Word. Amen? And he's anointed. He is an anointed preacher. Luke 4, 4 verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now, as he's reading to the congregation there, might have been, you know, 100, 150 people. It's not that big in Nazareth. He takes the passage of Scripture they all knew pointed to the Messiah. And he reads it. And usually when you get done reading that, you say, may the Messiah come. Soon the Messiah will come. We're longing for the Messiah to come. So they're, they're, they're soaking it up so far. And he reads, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Well, he tells them these words are fulfilled in your hearing. He's saying, the Spirit has anointed me. Matthew 3, verse 16, you know this. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. You know, whenever we have a baptism, as we just did, I always like to tell the people being baptized, you should claim Jesus' experience. Jesus was not baptized for his sin. He was baptized as an example for us of what we should expect. When Christ was baptized, the heavens were open. You have the heavens open in a new way when you're baptized because you've got a new relationship, right? It says, then the Spirit descends. God promises, says, be baptized and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 2. A promise of the Spirit is given, not just for Christ as the anointed, but to every believer. And says, and then it comes down like a dove. Peace should come into your life because your sins are forgiven. Right? You've come out of the water. The Holy Spirit will guide you now. And they heard a voice. You will hear God. You'll hear that still small voice saying, this is the way, walk in it. When you turn to the right hand or the left, God will guide you. You'll hear his spirit. And what does that voice say? This is my beloved son. He's now saying you are adopted. You are his son, his daughter. You are part of his family. The Bible says, behold, what manner of love the Father's bestowed on us that we should be called sons of God. Amen? So whenever you're baptized, the experience of Jesus is yours. And then he says, in whom I'm well pleased. He looks upon you after baptism as though you've never sinned. All your sins have been washed away. Amen? So Christ was anointed. Acts 10, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Notice there's this conflict between Christ and the devil, and he's casting out the devil and setting people free from the devil. Isaiah 42, 1. Behold my servant whom I uphold. Another messianic prophecy. My elect one in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. Now, why was Jesus anointed? Talked about what happened and who it happened to, but why did it happen? He's anointed me to preach. Jesus was given the Holy Spirit to preach. God gives us the spirit to witness what did Christ say to the apostles in Acts chapter 1? Wait in Jerusalem until you receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And you will be my witnesses. That wasn't just for Jesus, it's for you. He wants you to have the Spirit to be his witness. You can't be a very good witness without the Holy Spirit. But with the Holy Spirit, wonderful things will happen. God will tell you what to do and when to do it and how to do it. Amen? To preach what? The gospel. The good news. Now, you know, you can't really appreciate the good news until you know something about the bad news. Can I share with you the bad news? Because I want you to appreciate the good news. The bad news is that we are born sinners. Now, we're not born with a record of sin, but we're born with a sinful nature. And the penalty for sin, and we have all sinned, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, it is a deadly disease. God cannot allow it in the universe. The penalty 
is death. So we're all living under a death penalty. That's bad news. But God so loved the world, He gave His Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is good news. That's the difference between life and death. It doesn't get any better than that. If you know all those people out there that don't know Jesus are dying, and you know that through Jesus you can have eternal life, you got a lot of good news. They got bad news. You should share the good news with them because you will not run out of good news for you as you share it with them. Your good news gets gooder as you share it with others. You don't run low. Some of you are holding it back like there's only so much to go around. That's not true. The more you share it, the more you have. That's good news. We're supposed to preach the good news. He gives us the Holy Spirit to preach, witness the good news. Do you know this was one of the shortest sermons Jesus ever preached? It didn't have to be long. I don't think it'll be too long today either. Real quick, going through the things he said, preach the gospel to the poor. Did Jesus do that? Uh, technically, it was the poor that believed him. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. What does he mean by that? The one, but the, on this one I will look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit, who trembles at my word, the humble. It says he came to heal the brokenhearted. How many of you remember the story of this widow who is in a funeral train on her way to bury she has no husband she's a widow she's on her way to bury her only son that woman was broken hearted and then that funeral procession ran into Jesus and the apostles and he stopped the funeral and he touched the casket and her son came back to life he healed the broken hearted there's so many times Jesus heals the broken heart to proclaim liberty to the captives of course he came to set the captives free, those captive by sin, but literally captive by the devil. Another time in a synagogue, there's a woman who is doubled over with some disease or very serious osteoarthritis, and she's bent over, and Jesus said, this woman has been bound by the devil for 18 years, and he healed her, set her free, set liberty to the captives, people who are captives of the enemy. That's the story of the Exodus. He set a whole nation free. To offer recovery of sight to the blind. Did he literally heal the blind? People like blind Bartimaeus. And then you read in John chapter 9, a man born blind from birth. First thing he sees when he opens his eyes is the face of Jesus. Healing the blind. But beyond that, what did Jesus do? If you don't know the truth, you're blind. And if you're following the wrong people, you're following the blind leading the blind. He's talking about sight. He said, if you did not know, you would have no sin. But since you say you see, your sin remains. So some people are obviously spiritually blind. They're in darkness. Darkness covers the land and gross darkness of people. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. People who are being oppressed by, well, do you know, even the religious leaders were oppressing them. He says, you rob widows' houses. And for a pretense, you make long prayers. Jesus went into the temple with a cord and he chased out the money changers that were extorting and oppressing the people with their prices for religion. We still have that today too, right? To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. It's a very short sermon, but he's quoting from Isaiah. Jesus said, come unto me. God accepts us through Christ. Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. He begins his ministry by saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's within reach. Now, come, now. It's an acceptable. Now is the acceptable time. So Jesus, just in quoting Isaiah, he's summarizing his ministry. But what happened? Well, as he's sharing these things, the people are getting excited because he's talking about the Jewish jubilee. You read in the Bible there in Leviticus that when the Jubilee came after seven, seven years, so after 49 years, the 50th year was a Jubilee. All the debts were canceled. All the slaves were liberated. It was a, the possession. They got their land back. It was a time of great rejoicing. The Jubilee, and this is a term, the language he's using here is like the language of Jubilee. <clears throat> 
Jesus came to set us all free and to declare that the Jubilee had come. And he said, you'll know the truth. And what sets us free? The truth. So, so far, up to this point, the reason this is a historic message and place in the Bible, everything that Jesus has done has been spoken well of. From the time of his baptism, his teaching in Judea, his preaching, his teaching and miracles in Capernaum, or in, yeah, Capernaum and Galilee, all things had gone well. We have no record of any rejection to this point. Guess where the first record of rejection comes from? His home church. You would think he would have the, what they call the hometown advantage in sports. He doesn't. And it's, it's hard to comprehend. I know I ended up coming back to be the pastor of the church where I was baptized. Twice. And these people are the folks like, help me quit smoking. They saw me come into the church, believe it or not, don't laugh. I had a ponytail. You laughed. <laughs> I had torn jeans, smoking, drinking, really rough. These folks knew me. They loved me. They accepted me. They saw me gradually you know, get the victory, got baptized, started teaching Sabbath school. The Lord opened doors pretty soon. I'm preaching. Then I become a pastor, and I get assigned to come back. And it's so funny because when I first, I was in Texas when they asked me, do you want to come back and pastor Covalo? And it's like they were asking, you've probably never heard of this little town. And they said, it's, it's, it's a little town. It's only, and they're explaining it to me, and I'm going, yeah, I know all about it. I said, would you be willing? I said, would I? Of course. So I came back, and the folks, when I stood up and I preached, and they all knew me, and they were just beaming. It started out that way for Jesus. We've heard about the miracles you've been performing. We're so proud of you. Hometown boy, come home. And he says, but today, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. They thought, that's about the Messiah. Really? Where is he? He's here. And they're on the edge of their seats and they're listening and you look, now look at what happens. Go to Luke 4, 22. So it starts good. They all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words that proceeded from his mouth. This story is also in Mark 6, verse 2. Mark words it a little different. Mark 6, 2, it says, And many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which God has given to him? that he'd performed so many wonderful works at his hands. They'd heard about his miracles down there in Galilee and Capernaum, and, and now he's so wise, and they thought, he didn't go to the university in Jerusalem. Where did he get this wisdom? And uh, up to this point, it's gone good. But you know, in every congregation where God's people meet, there are angels of God there, and there are devils. Jesus had a devil. Jesus sits down at the table when Mary's washing his feet and the place is filled with perfume from her sacrifice and Judas says, what a terrible waste. That could have been sold and given to the poor. It could have paid for a year's wages. And then they all begin to murmur and look at Mary. It would have been a nice meeting if the devil had kept his mouth closed. Somebody in the crowd that day is listening. They're hearing everyone go, wow, this is wonderful, amazing. And they go, you've got to be kidding me. You know who that is? That's the carpenter's son. That's Joseph's son. We know him. He, he can't be the Messiah. How could he do all those wonderful works? And the devil was in the crowd sowing doubt that day soon as that happened. Now, we don't know. Jesus may have taught a little while before it got to that point, but somewhere along the way when they realized that he's saying he's the Messiah, they sat back and they folded their arms and they scoffed. And Jesus is looking out there. He knows these people. He sees, you know, there's Eliezer, the butcher, and the baker, the candlestick maker. They're all there that day. People he grew up with. They got something wrong. They said, this is Joseph's son. Was he Joseph's son? It says, the thing conceived in her was of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was called the Son of God. 
He was not the son of Joseph. Joseph was sort of a surrogate father, a good man, but he was not his father. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. They thought he's just the son of Joseph. No. He was the son of God, and they had problems accepting that. And from that point, you could say it started to go down, downhill. Let me read this to you. Go back to the book of Luke. And uh, they said, oh, it can't be him, it's Joseph's son. And he said to them, he knew that Jesus read their hearts. He said, you will surely say this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Whatever you have done in Capernaum, do here in your country. They said, you did these miracles down there, do it here. But you know, the Bible says in Nazareth, he only healed a few people because of their unbelief. His own town. Then he said to them, oh, wait a second. So he experiences unmitigated rejection now. Um, after the words of grace that he spoke, then they speak words of doubt. Is not this the carpenter's son? The son of Mary? His brother James and Joseph, Judas and Simon. So Jesus had at least half brothers and at least two sisters, because it says sisters, plural, we don't know. Could have had 20 sisters, but it's his sisters. Here with us. So they were offended at him. Instead of saying, praise the Lord, the Messiah comes from our hometown, they're offended. Jesus noticed their offense. He says, okay, now I've got to tell them straight. By the way, you notice that Jesus is a prophecy preacher. What scroll does he get? The scroll of Isaiah the prophet. I take a heat every now and then from others. They say, you talk about prophecy in your church a little too much. Well, Jesus did too, didn't he? He asked for the scroll of the prophet. Don't ever be embarrassed about that. And then Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. Sometimes it's hard to reach your own house. <clears throat> you see examples in the Bible of uh, the uh, prophets and the apostles and the teachers struggling and the kings with friendly fire. A lot of soldiers in every battle seem to be lost to friendly fire. Who was it that tried to kill David? His own king, Saul, his own son, who was it that betrayed Jesus? Judas. Who turned him over to the Romans? His own people. Who, who sold Joseph? His brothers. You can see all through the Bible there's examples of friendly fire. Now could that happen in God's church? Did it happen in Jesus' hometown church? Don't miss this, friends. Wait, I, I won't say that yet. So, uh, no, he didn't have the hometown advantage. When he hung on the cross, he said, you'll say to me, physician, heal yourself. Did they say that to him? Mark 15, verse 30, when Jesus is hanging on the cross, they said, save yourself, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also mocking among themselves with the scribes said, he saved others, himself he cannot save. That's the same as saying, physician, heal yourself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we might see and believe. Even those who were crucified with him said the same thing. So this prophecy was literally fulfilled. Then you go to Luke 4, verse 24. Jesus continues. Assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you the truth. Many widows were in the land of Israel in the days of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months and there was a great famine throughout the land, but to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath, to the region of Zidon, a woman who was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman, the Syrian. How did they react to that? Luke 4.28, So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath before they're marveling at his gracious words. And they rose up and they thrust him out of the city. First they kicked him out of the church. Then they threw him out of the city. And they led him to the brow of a hill on which their city was built that they might throw him down over the cliff. But then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. He 
Angels protected him. They all went blind. He walked through the midst of them. Now, did Jesus go to the right church? Did he go on the right day? Did those people have the Bible? They were God's people. Did they have God's Spirit? No. Could that happen again? Here, you've got the devil casting Jesus out of church, and they've got the Bible. Now, I see the clock, but I've got to read, as they say, the rest of the story. Go back to Luke chapter 4. After this experience, it says, uh, so he passed through the midst of them. Go to verse 31. He went down to Capernaum. He goes back to Galilee, to the city of Galilee, and was teaching them in teaching them on the Sabbaths. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. Now in the synagogue, where is he again now? Synagogue, what day of the week? Teaching on the Sabbath. In the synagogue there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean devil. And he cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone, what have we to do with you, Jesus Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him in their midst, he, the man convulsed. There was a battle. It came out of him, and it did not hurt him. And they were all amazed and spoke with themselves, saying, What word is this? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the report about him went throughout the place in the surrounding region. The people in Capernaum, where the Gentiles are, they believe his word, and Jesus cast the devil out of the synagogue. He goes to his hometown, and they cast the Savior out of the synagogue. So you got the devil throwing him out, and then Jesus throws the devil out. Do you get that? Now I want you to back up, because this is where I think you're going to have an aha experience, if you're still with me. Why, when Jesus sees they're rejecting who I am, he quotes two Old Testament stories. That's when they just, they lose it. And they physically drag him out of the church. Why would you get so upset with a preacher for quoting two Bible stories? What does he quote? He says there were many lepers in the land of Israel in the days of Elisha, but none of them was cleansed but Naaman the Syrian. He's saying this Gentile soldier who is an enemy of Israel, who has leprosy, lepers were the lowest on the rung that none of the lepers in Israel were healed, but the Gentile was healed. Are you saying the Messiah is going to help the Gentiles? We're wanting the Messiah to come and kick the Gentiles out of our country. We are being oppressed by these Roman Gentiles. So you can see why that would bother them. And why would he help lepers? Lepers are cursed of God. They're unclean. And then he says, there are many widows in the land in the days of Elijah, when God shut up the heavens for three and a half years, but to none of them were they sent, no, no Hebrew widows, but he was sent to, Elijah is sent to a widow in Zidon. By the way, Jesus did go to a widow in Zidon, healed her daughter from a demon. And he multiplies the bread for her. Why did Jesus choose these stories? Notice, where does Christ begin his ministry? The Jordan River. Where is Naaman baptized? Jordan River. Cleansed from leprosy. Symbol for cleansing from sin. And general goes to battle. Christ begins his battle. Goes to battle with the devil in the wilderness. What happens in the story of Naaman? Elisha the prophet is betrayed by his servant for silver. Was Jesus betrayed for silver? Then you go to the other story of Elijah. And a widow, what does a widow represent? What does a woman represent? A church. And he stays with this woman, who's a Gentile. And he multiplies bread. Did Jesus multiply bread? And he resurrects her son. Is there a resurrection? Does God resurrect his son? In an upper room, does Jesus seal the covenant in the upper room? And how long does this time period, only one time period, Jesus mentions three and a half years. How long did Jesus minister? 
These two stories that Christ draws from summarize his ministry. His being rejected in Nazareth in his home church is an allegory of what would happen with the whole nation. When they found out that he was not just there to save Jews, but he was also going to save Gentiles, they turned him over to the Gentiles and he was crucified. And they said, physician, heal yourself. Save yourself. Come down from the cross. Can you see it, friends? This story, what happened there is an allegory. And I'll tell you one more way it's an allegory. Is you got two synagogues in chapter 4. You got one synagogue where the Savior is cast out of the synagogue by Satan. Like my story of the deacon and the head elder. Deacon is wrestling in the church. You got the other story where Jesus casts the devil out. And there's peace and truth in the synagogue. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. You're a little synagogue. Which is it with you? Is the truth of Jesus offending you and you're chasing him out? Or are you embracing him, inviting him in to chase the devil out? Everybody is going to be in one of two categories. I hope it's your desire to say, Lord, I accept your word. I want you to come into my heart and save me from my sin as you cleanse Naaman from leprosy. Feed me with the bread of life as you did that woman in Zidon. Help me to experience a resurrection in my, in my soul. As you raised up your son, you'll raise me up. You say amen? This summarizes the, the ministry of Jesus here in that story. Is that your desire, your prayer?